It's one thing that the NBA does that it feels like not many other leagues do is the teams that get formed in the offseason are just massive. Obviously, this year, Damian Lillard going from Portland to Milwaukee was a huge story. I mean, Lillard was, has been a story for a couple of years now, but is that something that the NBA wants and is cognizant of? Like the Pacers, for instance, they just made a move for Pascal Siakam. Mm-hmm. Like, are, are those type of teams where there are multiple stars on each team something that the NBA likes? Or is, you know, this kind of contract? 65 game rule is that something that also kind of factors into the hey if guys do stay with their teams longer then they do have that potential to you know have the escalators in the contracts like we talked about and to piggyback on that LeBron was almost at the Golden State Warriors <laughs> Bingo, yeah. just a couple days ago I, I read that. I, I have no other knowledge other than I read that there was those discussions. So who knows? But, oh, to say they don't they don't run that by like LeBron no, going to the Golden State Warriors. That they, feels it like only something. it only comes to the league office if they actually have a proposed trade. Then we have to approve it. But for as I just read the reports that if owners are talking to each other about possible moves or GMs, absolutely not. They, and, and in fact, I. I, I if they, they're laughing to hear me say this. They don't trust the league office. <laughs> if they're thinking about something like that, we're the last people they're going to tell until they have to. Would you approve that trade? You know, it's interesting. For, for us, we don't have discretion. If a trade, because I, I get this question all the time, if a trade was in, is within the rules, it's within the rules. And I don't think you would want, back to my point before about the sort of rule of law around sports, I don't think people would want me sitting here saying, I don't think that's good for the league. That could, I mean, the rules are the rules. If we don't like the rules, next time we sit down and collect a bargaining, we should change it. But to your question, so... So you would approve that? If it were, if it fit under the rules, I would have to. It's not within my discretion. Well, the Chris is Paul that, yeah, is that a new rule? Because Chris Paul well, got the, the, the Lakers. The, the, all right, I'm going to defend <laughs> my 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 former boss and mentor, David. <laughs> Stern. Rest in peace. So, at, rest in peace. At, at that point, David was acting as the, in essence, owner of New Orleans. Got it. Uh-huh. He was. Makes it sense. was a, a, an unusual situation there, and he was wearing two hats. And his view when that trade came to him. He didn't think that trade was in the best interest of the team. Incidentally, when I learned my lesson, there was a period when the league office was running the Clippers when, when Donald oh, yeah. Sterling was, was banned from the league. And I brought in a guy named Dick Parsons, and who'd been the this former CEO of, of Time Warner. And I said, Dick, you are now running the Los <laughs> Angeles Clippers. You're making decisions about basketball, not me. So, and now to Connor's question that, so, we, in successive collective bargaining agreements, have, I think, done a good job incrementally creating more, I would say, parity around the league. And, and by parity, not to me, it's, it would be fake parity if you sort of played it as if, let's just divvy up the players around the league and say everyone, every team should get one superstar of this level, one there. I, I, to me, I think of it as parity of opportunity because... The great GMs, the great management in this league should have an advantage. And you're seeing that now in small and big markets when you have really good people running teams. And then to your point about someone like Damian Lillard leaving, I mean, one, of course we want guys to honor contracts. In some cases, behind closed doors, I think teams and players are coming to agreement that it may be time for the player to move on. And so it's, it's a mutual decision. But I, I also think one of the things we've worked towards, again, over, over the years in, through collective bargaining is shortening contracts and trying to find the right balance. Because remember, in our system, we pay out in the aggregate, call it you know, 50% of the revenue of the league, not a penny less, penny more. And then it's just the question of how that money gets distributed among 450 guys. So when, when, when we come up with a system where, for example, a team can pay its own player more, that of course creates an incentive for the player to stay in that market, but the player could choose to still move on. When we shorten contracts, on one hand, if I were representing the players, I'd say, well, you want guaranteed money. You don't want a position where oh, yeah. guy blows out his knee or whatever. There's just all kinds of risk where a guy is out of luck or, or just his skill declines. Let a, guy, let a guy take advantage of the leverage when he has it. But remember, Magic Johnson had a 25-year contract. <sighs> Damn. It, it, and people went crazy at the time. And Jerry Buss was a genius and probably made incredible good business sense for Magic Johnson. But now, you know, we've essentially reduced maximum contracts to five years, in some cases six. So now, you know, we used to refer to it in the league as sort of dead money at the end of the bench. You'd have a star player, but then enter, let's say, a nine-year contract or eight-year contract or seven-year contract. They would know at the time they negotiated that contract just analytically, it was unlikely that this player was going to be at the top of his game towards those end years. Now, the player had the leverage in totality to get that money, 
But it also meant, and, and not to take anything away from the player, but if that player were sitting at, at the end of the bench and were a max player, there wasn't sufficient money to have guys on your roster that were going to help you win champions. Good, yeah. So mm -hmm. I think, again, when you shorten contracts, again, if you have a system where in the aggregate you're going to pay out 50%, by definition, it has to go to someone else. So it's, it, it might surprise you guys, but when you're sitting across from a group of players and you move more towards a pay per performance and it's a fixed pool of money, that's not something that players come in who are automatically against, especially players who believe in themselves, <laughs> you know, who are saying, like, it's fine. I like this paper performance. Because the other hand, if you have a shorter contract and you feel you're underpaid you're or you free. haven't had a chance to, to – you become a free agent. Also, it's like, I'm going to show them, and then my next contract, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make even more. Yeah, I think everything that you guys do business-wise with the players mm -hmm. is idolized by every other league. Yeah. So you need to know. Come on, Bob. It's NBA on the list. Come on, Bob.